Hello my friends, it's the Game Boy Geek here and today we'll be young detectives working together to solve neighborhood mysteries. We'll be trying to find the motive, suspect, location, crime, and object. Spy Club is a cooperative game for 2 to 4 players ages 10 and up and takes about 45 minutes to play and is published by Renegade Game Studios alongside Foxtrot Games. Spy Club is designed to be a 5 game mosaic campaign where you'll unlock new rules and other elements that change the game every time you play. But you can always play the game as a single game and then decide if you want to continue with the campaign or reset everything back to the beginning. Today we'll be doing a rule school where I'll teach you how to set up and play the game so that you don't have to read the rule book yourself. Now I've placed timestamps in the description of this video in case you want to jump to a specific section of the rules. Without further ado, let's get started. Spy Club is a 2-4 player cooperative game where you'll be one of these characters working together to try to solve neighborhood mysteries. You'll be trying to solve all five aspects like the motive, suspect, location, crime, and object by getting five of that type of aspect to solve it. You'll be trying to find the right clues by investigating cards and you can also trade cards with others that have the same focus type as you. You'll be able to shift your focus to line up with other players which allow you to do bonus actions together and you'll be getting new ideas as you do this which will help you get more cards in the future. But watch out because each round the suspect is on the move and sometimes they'll move up this escape track and if they get to the end, the game is ended. And the suspect also moves along other people's cards, activating other detrimental events. The Spy Club is a mosaic game which means you'll unlock new rules and other elements that change the game every time you play, but it can still be played as an individual game. To set up, you first want to find the two interlocking pieces that will make up the central board. In the bottom left hand corner, you're going to want to make sure that it says standard. If not, you'll want to flip the boards over and find the one that says standard because that's going to be the bottom left of the central board. You'll then put the board together just like a puzzle, like that. Next, on the bottom left hand corner of the board, you're going to place the escape marker right there where it says standard. This is going to be the escape track that you'll use throughout the game. You're also going to add the 18 idea tokens. Now these look like these light bulbs. Just create a supply off to the side of the board for everyone. Next, you're going to create the movement deck. Find these different little cards and they're three different types. There's daytime, there's sunset, and then there is nighttime. Once you've separated these out to the three types, shuffle each of these different piles separately. Once they're shuffled, you'll randomly take one away of each of these and place them back in the box without looking at them. Then you're going to stack all these face down with nighttime on the bottom, then sunset with daytime on top, so you could do something like this. Then take that deck and place it right on top of where it says movement deck on the central board. Next you're going to find all of the clue cards and you're going to create a shuffled deck of these cards. When splitting the deck up to shuffle, it's best to keep the orientation in the same way so that all the cards are facing in the same direction. Also when shuffling, occasionally it's good to cut the deck in half and flip the cards over because these are double sided, but again keeping the same type of orientation. Now these cards are double sided and once they're shuffled and placed together as one solid deck, you always want to just keep the top side of these cards facing. You never want to flip these cards over unless an action or an ability tells you to. Next find the clue card tray and you can place that just above the board. You'll take that shuffled deck of clue cards and place it right into this tray. Next you'll locate the incoming clue play cards. They have awnings on one side of it and it will have the amount of players on the back side of it. So for example if we're playing with three players we would remove the one that says just simply two players. This is two to three, two to four, and two to four. So you'll just, for the player count you're playing with, use the right play cards. Then you'll place those play cards on the side up just next to the card tray. Now the number two will always go over the card tray and you can see there's a little number two here and a little number two here to help you out with that. All the rest of them are gonna go in descending order from left to right, so we have one and then zero. And so if you were playing with two players, you'd place the two ones in between the two and zero. Then you'll take the clue cards from the card tray and place them underneath the play cards going from right to left. So there's one under each of them and there's one still on top of the card tray. And remember never to flip these cards. Next we'll set up the players. 
Each player will get a player board. Now this will be made up of two interlocking boards as you see here. If you're playing with three or four players, you'll use one large board and one small board and you'll simply put them together just like this. If you're playing with two players, each of you will use two large boards because they're double sided and you'd put it together like that. You'll randomly assign a first player and you'll start dealing that player clue cards from the clue deck. Remember never to flip them over. The starting player will get one card for each of their spots going from right to left. Once they're all filled up, you'd then go to the next player clockwise and keep doing this until all players have all their clue spots filled up. Each player's cards are collectively known as their hand. Each player will then select which color they'd like to be. They'd take the focus token from that color and they'd place it below their rightmost card. This is now currently known as their focus card. Each player will also get one idea token from the supply and this star player will take the suspect token and place it just above their rightmost card. Next, locate the eight character cards. Each player gets to choose which character will represent them. You'll then name that character by taking a blank sticker, writing the name on it, and affixing it to the spot shown on the card. After naming your character, you'll also take one of the double-sided player aid cards that will help you out throughout the game. Now, as I mentioned in the intro, this game is meant to be played as a campaign, but you can play it as a standalone game without doing a campaign, but you'll still set it up the same way. Now, there's two campaign decks, one and two, in the box. I recommend you leave these decks of cards here so they don't spill and come out of order. You're going to go to campaign deck one. If you take this top card off, it says, hey, watch out. You shouldn't be going through this unless you're already told to do so. And then cards are numbered one and then that's two. The number one was the top one. You're going to take cards three and four and place them out by the board. And you have cards three and four out. There's A's and B sides. A's are the front, B's are the backs. And this basically tells you when you'll be flipping these over at certain parts throughout the game. And these will make a little bit more sense as we go through the rules, but get them out for now. The object of the game is to work cooperatively to solve all five aspects of the case. Motive, suspect, location, crime, and object. And you'll solve an aspect of the crime by getting five pieces of evidence confirmed of the same type. In this case, these all match in color and logo for object. So in this case, we would have solved the aspect of object. You're trying to do this for all five aspects of the case. Over the course of the game, players will be taking turns in clockwise order. And in those turns, you'll be going through three phases. You'll be using actions, you'll be refilling some cards, and then you'll be moving the suspect. And starting with that first player, they'll be able to use up to three actions. And since you're trying to confirm five of the same clues of any aspect of the case, we'll do that first. So one of the actions you can take is confirm. And you can take any of the three cards that's in your hand, and you can add it to the center row below the board. Now there is a cost and ideas for this. Now, wherever your focus token is, if you're using the card just above that, it costs you zero ideas. But for every card further off from that you go, you add one idea that you have to spend. For example, if I wanted to use the garbage man and confirm that, since it's two spaces from my focus token, it would cost me two ideas. At the beginning of the game, I only have one idea. So on my first action, I could either confirm this without spending one, or I could confirm the game piece by spending one because it's one away from that focus token. Now you can put it into any empty slot that you choose, or you can exchange it with any card that's already there. So let's say I wanted to put it here. I would exchange that with the Boolean card. And that Boolean card would go in the same spot that I confirmed that other card from. Now remember, you can do up to three actions on your turn, and you can do the same one multiple times, and you can do them in any order. Another possibility is to shift focus, and that is to move your focus token to any of the other cards in your hand. Then you'll gain one idea for each card in your hand that matches the aspect of your new focus card. In this case, I only have one object, so I get one idea. However, if my hand looked like this when I moved this, I'd get two ideas, one for my aspect of the new focus card and another one because this one matches the same aspect. There's another type of aspect cards that we haven't yet talked about. They're called distractions. They're gray like this video games card. You can shift your focus to one of these, making it your new focus card, but you never gain idea tokens for doing so. Another action is called investigate. This allows you to flip any number of your clue cards once. Now you can flip your clue cards in any order and one at a time, and you can decide after each flip if you want to continue flipping. For example, I don't want this distraction card, so I'm going to flip it. Hey, hey, we have another object. And maybe I want to flip bullying, hoping to find another object there. Ooh, I found a prank. And let's just say I decide to stop flipping. 
Now those would have been my three actions. Again, keeping in mind, you could do them in any order and you can repeat actions up to three and you never have to do all three. It's always up to three. However, let me just show you what that fourth possible option is for an action, it's called Scout. You can draw one clue card among the incoming ones. Now those ones are all here. All three of these, including the one in the card tray, are all incoming clues. Now to draw that card, you have to spend a certain amount of ideas displayed on the play card above that. So this one does not cost me any, all the way up to two. So let's say I spent those ideas, and those always go to the supply, and I take this card here, now you can either put it in an empty spot in your hand if you have one, or you can choose to discard any card and place it in that spot, remembering never to flip the card when doing this. And you can just set the discard pile just above the other cards. Now after completing up to those three actions, you go to the refill phase. Now let's say for instance I had two open slots here. You'd start with the rightmost incoming clue, and then fill that into the rightmost empty spot on your player board. So this one would go just like that. And then you take the top card of the clue deck and refill the last spot like that. Now, regardless of if you've refilled your hand or not, you would then refill the incoming clues. If all the spots are empty, you simply fill them from right to left, just like that. However, if only some of the spots are empty, you'd slide everything to the right and then fill the empty slots in right to left like that. Then you'll go to phase three, which is moving the suspect. You're going to take the top movement card and then flip it over on the board right here. Now two things could possibly happen. One, it shows just the suspect and it's gonna be connected to one of the numbers on the previous card or in the first round to the board here. And this shows you it's connected to a one. This means that suspect pawn is going to move one and they always move clockwise. And in this case, it's over the aspect of crime. And so you look on the board to see which event is triggered by that. For crime, you discard the two rightmost incoming clues and refill. So in this case, we would discard these and we would refill these as normal. And if it's any of the other ones, you just do as they say on the board. Some of these events require you to remove ideas. These should come from the general supply, if available, and or from the personal supply of one or more players of your choice. And when they're removed from the game, you just place them over in the discard area. Now, if the suspect pawn is ever supposed to move off the current player, it simply moves to the rightmost card of the next player to the left. When the suspect moves to a gray distraction card, no event happens since the suspect has been distracted. When moving the suspect, another possibility can happen. First of all, if it's after the first one of the game, you would just move this over like this and then flip this over and line it up like that. So here, the suspect is gonna move three, like I just showed you before, but if it has this logo on it that has an arrow up and a number, then you'll move the escape marker. So the escape marker would move towards the escaped, and if it ever gets there, the game would end before you cracked the case. Now after that player has used their up to three actions, refilled, and moved the suspect, it'd be the next player clockwise turn. However, there are some additional teamwork bonus activities that you can do throughout your turn that I'll cover now. On your turn, as long as you've not yet used your final action, you can carry out one or more teamwork bonuses with other players whose focus card is of the same aspect of yours. In this case, these two players have their focus card on the object, the same aspect, so they can do some teamwork bonus activities together. One of them is to get advice. You can take any number of ideas from another player. And in this case, whenever you're doing these teamwork bonuses, the players involved should be agreeing with this. The other thing you could do is compare notes and that's trading cards. So in this case, since we have the same aspect on our focus, we can trade cards and you can even have that player trade a card that was their focus card. Now, of course, when doing this, uh, they have to both agree as well. Also, if any player gives away a card or a token with these teamwork bonuses, they cannot take it back on the same turn. And you cannot use these teamwork bonuses if your focus card is on a gray distraction card. As soon as there's five clue cards of the same aspect type in the center row, you've solved the corresponding aspect of the case. Now, you might want to pause and make note of how many actions that player has left, because they'll be taking them after we do some of these next steps. To identify which clue card is the solution, you find the symbol in the most recent movement card, and you look for that symbol here, and that is the solution. In this case, it's lipstick. Also notice that even though we have five of the same aspect, we do have a duplicate here as lipstick, and that's okay as long as you have five of the same aspect. So you would set this solution off to the side of the board, and you would put the rest of these in the discard pile. And keep in mind, just because we've solved object, we still need to solve the crime, location, suspect, and motive, and you can only solve each aspect once each game. 
Now keep in mind when trying to solve crimes that the most readily available cards are objects all the way down in order to the least readily available is motive. All the clue card counts are on your player aids. If you solve all the aspects of the case, you have successfully solved the case. However, there are four different ways the game could end before you crack the case. One is if the escape marker gets to escaped. The next is being out of ideas when there's not enough ideas remaining to remove from the game when required to do so by an event. Another is being out of time when you don't have a movement card to draw at the end of a player's turn. And the final way is being clueless where you don't have enough incoming clue to fill the player's hands. At the end of the game, it's encouraged to spend some time creating a story that connects the details of the case. For example, that librarian that works for that rich guy that has tons of money that lives in that mansion was lying about my mom's lipstick in his pocket. Now if you did not solve all five aspects, you're still encouraged to come up with a story using cards that you've seen that game either in the player's hands or in the discard pile. Now if you want to make an even more difficult game, you can flip the board over and use the advance side. This makes the escape track shorter and the events harsher. That should be everything you need to start your first game of Spy Club. At the end of the game, you'll flip over card four, and this will introduce you to the campaign. Spy Club is designed to be played as a five game campaign, and there are a few additional things you'll need to know. The five games in a campaign represent five crimes that are laying the groundwork for a master crime, and each game you'll be able to record one aspect of that master case. At the end of each case in the campaign, you'll have the opportunity to record one new aspect of the master case and that master case is going to have one aspect in common with the case that you just finished. So let's say of the five different aspects, these were the cards of each of the aspects that we had found and we successfully finished the case. In this case, you would select any one of these to be that new aspect of the master case. So let's say we select the diner. Now, next to the case number that this is in this campaign, you would write down the aspect type, in this case location, and the solution name, in this case diner. You then score points. You'll earn five points if you recorded the new aspect of the master case, and you'd earn three points for each of the aspects that you currently solved. So let's say instead of finding all five of those, we actually found these three before we ended the game. We'd get five points for identifying a new aspect and nine points for finding three things for a total of 14 points. Now, some of your unlock cards might have text with a pencil icon on it. And this indicates something that you should do when you record the outcome of each case and just follow the instructions on that card. And some of the cards might have a flag icon showing you that you need to do something at the end of a case and again, follow the instructions on the card. Now, optionally, you can go right into the next case of that campaign right away in the same session and you'd reset all the normal game components, but you would not reset the campaign deck. However, you don't need to play multiple cases of a campaign in a single sitting. There's bags that are given in the game, and you can use these to put together that like each character has their own bag, or they put their character in any campaign-specific cards to them. And then there's a general bag that you can put all the generalized campaign cards. And always be sure to put the cards in the bag with the correct side face up, and then put them in the box the correct side face up, so you know which cards are flipped and which ones are not. Now, some of the unlock cards might have a text with the envelope icon, and this indicates that you should do something special when saving your progress. When you start a new game in the campaign, the first thing you'll do is unlock new content. Now, if you remember, you selected one card that was part of the master case from the last game. In this case, we chose the diner. Now, if you look on the campaign card index, you'll see next to our diner, it says 122. You would then grab that card number 122 from the campaign deck and follow the instructions on the front of it. Now, generally speaking, the campaign cards in the bottom right hand corner might have an arrow and this tells you to flip the card when you're done reading or it might have a lock, which means you don't flip it until it tells you to. Now, on the bottom left, it might have other cards that you need to unlock after reading through that specific card. And some of those might have a star next to it. And that just means that that card can be unlocked from other cards within the campaign deck, meaning you might get go to get that card and it might not be there. And that's OK, because it's probably already out. Now, if you're starting a new game within the campaign from a different sitting, you'll then restore all your saved progress by taking the different cards from the different plastic bags and getting things set up. And ensure when doing this to keep all the face up cards in the right direction so you don't see anything you're not supposed to see. Now, if you're playing with players that have already played a case in this campaign, they don't need to select a new character. They can keep the character they've played already. However, if you add a new player, allow them to select a character the same way as during the original setup, because you can bring new people in and out of the campaigns. 
And some of your unlocked cards might have a gear icon on them, and that tells you there's something specific to do at the start of this new case. And then you'll play the case and follow all the rules at the end of the campaign that we've already covered. Now when playing in campaign mode, it's possible that another player might also have empty slots in their hands, and you'd refill your hand first as normal, and then refill the hands of other players in clockwise order. The campaign deck might introduce ways to solve aspects other than having five of the same aspect types in that center row. Now, if the card identified by the symbol on the most recently drawn movement card, like in this case, it was the X, and if that does not match the aspect that's being solved, you look back to the previous movement card, in this case, sort of the square there. And you'd keep doing this until you find a symbol that does identify a valid solution, which is one of that specific aspect. Now the campaign deck might also introduce other objectives beyond solving the five aspects, and if you solve all five but you still have an additional objective you want to complete, you can continue to play instead of finishing. Now at the end of the five game campaign, you're going to give your team a letter grade based on that score. You simply add up the scores of the five different games within that campaign, and you look at the sliding chart here and you give yourself a grade. Then you can reset the campaign deck, put everything back where they belong, in the right order, facing in the right way, and you can remove any stickers that were added during the campaign, or you can alternatively affix a new blank white sticker over them. And the back of the rulebook has a campaign reference to help you walk through the different steps as well. Well, I hope this helped you dive right into Spy Club and get to the fun quicker than you normally would if you had to read the rulebook yourself. Now, if you have any further questions, I placed a link below me in the description of this video, and that's the best place to ask them, because not only will I be notified, but so will Renegade Game Studios and Foxtrot Games.